Samyutta, uh, which talks about feelings. And then last week we talked about the senses, the sense doors, if you like, from the Salayatana Samyutta. And we're going hand backward in the book. Maybe there's a, a logic to that. I usually read books backwards, actually, but they're all very much interconnected. So um, I guess we started with feelings because it's a very obvious place to begin our practice, especially our practice of understanding these five aggregates that comprise what we take to be a self and, um, and the whole of existence as we know it, but also the sense doors, because that is where contact arises that um, leads to feeling in the first place. Feeling is contingent on contact at one of the six sense doors at any given time. And today we're going into the five aggregates in a bit more detail. And as I said, these five aggregates basically are the sum total of existence from a slightly different angle. The six senses also describes the whole of our existence. Uh, the whole of this body and mind. But uh, I think working with the five aggregates is quite a tangible way to work and to start to um, break down what's really going on in our body and mind. So um, I have the introduction here and I was thinking that what I should have really done last week is uh, give you some homework, which would be to read the introduction before this uh, discussion. Um, but if you wish, you can do that after the discussion, just read the introduction and it might make perhaps uh, easy reading, perhaps once we've already uh, discussed some of the content in depth. But one little um, table from the introduction, which is on page 841, is quite a nice summation of what these aggregates are about. And it's table five, it's called the five aggregates according to the suttas, based on uh, Samyutta 2256, which sounds to me like it might be an Atalakana Sutta. Is it? No, 56? No, it's not. It's uh, phases of the clinging aggregates. So that goes into some depth. Um, but anyway, this applies to all the suttas in the Samyutta Nikaya. So uh, I don't know if you have the book. How many of you have the book? Okay. So maybe I'll just show you what it looks like and then I'll read it. It's basically just describing each aggregate in a bit of detail. So it looks like this. <laughs> Can you actually see anything? You can? Okay, I'm going to read it, okay, but it's just to show you how it's broken down into form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness, okay? So this is basically how we experience the world. So the first of the five aggregates is this thing called form, which is like the material aspect um, of ourselves and of the, of the world, really, anything that's material. And this includes, it's basically derived from the four great elements. Okay, so it is the four great elements and any form derived from them. So the four great elements in Buddhism are like earth, water, fire, and air. Okay, so whatever is material can be broken down in this way. And the condition for the arising of form is nutriment. So this is kind of easy to understand mm -hmm. if you consider what happens to the body if we don't feed it. You know, if there's no nutriment, and nutriment's not only food, is it? It's also contact and consciousness, I think. Is it nutriment? I think so. Um, there's actually four nutriments, I think. It's definitely food, it's contact, and I think it's consciousness as well, and maybe one more, so I haven't done my homework, but you can find that out, it can be your homework. And this gives rise to form. So I'll just go through these fairly briefly, otherwise it's kind of like a lecture. But the second one is feeling, and feeling we've defined previously in the uh, second to the last sort of discussion as um, you could say it's the hedonic tone of experience. It's the aspect of experience that's pleasant, painful, or somewhere in between. 
And there are six classes of feeling. So there's feeling born of contact through the eye, feeling born of contact through the ear, through the nose, through the tongue, through the body, and through the mind. So quite often we think of feeling as born through the body, right? We think of feeling or Vedana as sensations which we can experience in the body. But there are also other causes, if you like, born of contact through things we see, which can be pleasant, painful, or somewhere in between, uh, through sound, hmm? creates a certain kind of feeling, through smell, through taste, through tangibles, so touch and any other feelings arising in the body, and then through mind as well. And the condition for feeling is that contact. You know, unless we come in contact with those um, objects of the senses, there is no feeling. If we don't see a form with the eye, then we don't have eye consciousness, and so there's no feeling based on that consciousness. I hope this is not too complicated. Mm -hmm. Is this okay? No comment. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> so the next one is perception, and there are six classes of perception. And this is again based on the six senses. So there are perceptions of forms, sounds, odors, tastes, tactiles, and mental phenomena. And again, the condition for that is contact. And there are six classes of the next one. This is volitional formations or sankhara. Volition regarding forms, sounds, odors, tastes, tactiles, and mental phenomena. In other words, what we do with those things, how we react to them, what we make of them. And the condition for those, again, is that contact between the senses and their objects. And then for consciousness, there are six classes of consciousness, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness. And the condition for that is this thing called Nama Rupa, which is basically mind and all the phenomena that we can know with the mind, including material form. Okay, so it's important, especially for consciousness, to remember that there are six types. I think for the others, it's easier to remember, but often when we refer to consciousness, we immediately think, oh, that's the mind, or that means what we know through the mind sense door, but it's also what we're aware of, the eye consciousness, in other words, seeing and ear consciousness. They're different kinds of consciousness, so there are six classes of consciousness. So, with that little explanation, which I hope is not too complex <clears throat> or too dry, um, we're going to move to one of the suttas in the Kanda Samyutta. But before we do that, are there any comments or questions? Have I lost any of you at all? Or can we continue with that as running in the background? What do you think? Yes. Salute. What does nutriment mean? Yeah, so um, I was saying that nutriment is of different kinds, and certainly one of those nutriments is food, ahara. Another one is contact, so it's what nourishes. Uh, is it chaitana? Mm. Yeah. And the third one is chaitana, or uh, will, if you like. So these give rise to form. Anyway, I don't want to get too far into it, but it's easy to understand in terms of food, right? That without food, there'll be no um, material form, but also without contact. Because if you think about it, the way Ajahn Brahm describes this is that um, if there's a person who can't see, smell, taste, hear, touch, or even know with the mind, then the body is likely to die. There's nothing keeping it going. There's no kind of impetus for the life force, if you like. Yeah? Anyway, we don't want to get too stuck on that, but I hope that makes some sense. It's another big topic. So um, it could be another sutta for another day. We could go further into detail with that. Anything from anyone here before we continue? Well, um, I just wanted to share the meaning of the word kanda because. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the word it's like it's like sounds very complicated but it's just a heap he's it's just it's just um i have to say in singhala kande is a very common word that just means hill hill it just means hill and that helped me click this is a very simple thing the buddha is just saying these are just um just ways of ca- five heaps that we can categorize our entire experience into so um yeah i just find it the word kanda is actually just a very simple common common word in pali and singhala yeah sometimes in english it's translated as aggregate which is a really strange word because it sounds like some kind of concrete element mm. <laughs> something you make concrete with but um i actually like components of existence so they're kind of bits yeah they're components they're heaps they're lumps if you like but they kind of comprise what we know of as existence so i quite like the word components of existence i like that translation Yeah. So the little sutta that we're going to look at is number 5 and here it's translated as concentration which uh mm-hmm. is not the best word for samadhi but it basically means samadhi. And um and the Buddha is talking about the importance of developing samadhi. So he's using the word concentration here. This is Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation and he's saying that someone who is concentrated So he's still saying that I'm going to say samahita which means has um got a level of stillness whose mind has become still unified if you like. Yeah. Shall I read it? Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Thus have I heard at sawati dot dot dot. <laughs> And I'm not sure what the dot 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 is but it usually says at Jeta's Grove in Anatta Pindika's park so it's setting the scene and that's a place that the Buddha lived for many many years I think something like 12 rains retreats was it was it there yeah I'm pretty sure he spent about 12 vasas in Savati so it says there the blessed one said this and here the word is bikus but i'll say community to include everybody so community develop samadhi a person who has samadhi or who's who is samahita who is concentrated composed stilled serene unified understands things as they really are so this is that very uh famous um condition in the process of um dependent liberation that from samadhi one sees things as they really are samadhi pachaya yata bhuta jnana dasana and what does one understand as it really is so this is what we do with a stilled mind the origin and passing away of form that's the first kanda the origin and passing away of feeling the second one the origin and passing away of perception the origin and passing away of volitional formations the origin and passing away of consciousness and what bhikkhus or community or monastics is the origin of form what is the origin of feeling what is the origin of perception what is the origin of volitional formations and what is the origin of consciousness so this is already interesting because the buddha's teaching is always going back to the source it's always looking at how things have arisen where do they come from so that we can actually find that cause and hopefully um eradicate it so that there's no more arising of things that cause suffering so one of the purposes of um of the path is so that we can not only see things as they are but go back to the source go back to where things come from uh yoni so manasikara to use our minds in ways that gets to the source of things 
And then he answers us here, but of course, this is theoretical and we have to figure out how this applies to our lives. So here, people, one seeks delight, one welcomes and one remains holding. And what is it that one seeks delight in? What does one welcome? To what does one remain holding? One seeks delight in form, welcomes it and remains holding to it. As a consequence of this, delight arises. Delight in form is clinging. With, cling, with one's clinging as condition, existence comes to be or arises. With existence as condition, birth. With birth as condition, aging and death. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. So this is already quite a lot. And this is about delighting in form. So shall I just continue reading? Because the same things apply to each kanda, but it might be nice to explore each one a little bit. So um, I'll maybe just keep reading the same formula and we'll see um, how it works out, the different nuances there. Uh, so there's a dot, dot, dot here. One six delight in form, one six delight in feeling. Okay, so the next thing. Um, so the question is the same, right? And what is the origin? I oh, know we've done the origin, sorry. Um, okay, so here, community, one seeks delight, one welcomes and one remains holding. And what is it that one seeks delight in? What does one welcome? To what does one remain holding? One seeks delight in feeling, welcomes it and remains holding to it. As a consequence of this, delight arises. Delight in feeling is clinging. With feeling as, oh sorry, with clinging as condition, existence comes to be. With existence as condition, birth. With birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, plain displeasure and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. And again, one seeks delight in perception. Uh, one seeks delight in perception, welcomes it and remains holding to it. As a consequence of this, delight arises. Delight in perception is clinging. With one's clinging as condition, existence, com existence comes to be. With existence as condition, birth. With birth as condition, aging, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. One seeks delight in volition, welcomes it and remains holding to it. As a consequence of this, delight arises. Delight in volition is clinging. With one's clinging as condition, existence, with existence, birth, with birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. And then lastly, one seeks delight in consciousness, welcomes it and remains holding to it. As a consequence of this, delight arises. Delight in consciousness is clinging. With one's clinging as condition, existence comes to be. With existence, birth, with birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. 
This bhikkhus or community is the origin of form. This is the origin of feeling, perception, volitional formations and consciousness. Okay, I'm going to pause there because that's a lot and that's deep and that might be challenging also to many of us here and perhaps needs a bit of unpacking because I think one of the questions it might bring up is, uh, you know, what do we do then except for delighting in these things? Is it really bad to delight in these things? Is that, you know, always uh, unethical? Maybe there are differences, maybe it's the degree or to what we cling to that makes the difference. How are we to understand this in a way that really um, helps us to gain insight into what's happening, first of all? And uh, one of the observations I have of this is that the Buddha is pointing out a process. He's pointing out a sequence. He's not saying anywhere that you should not. He's not saying it's bad. He's just simply pointing out that this is what happens. And this is how suffering comes to be. And he's inviting us to investigate this for ourselves, right? So remember earlier on in this um, sutta, it says, how, what do we understand as it really is? It's the origin and passing away of these five khandhas. So he's described the origin, and this is something to be understood, right? It's again, something not to condemn, but something to start gaining insight into. So it'd be really interesting to hear any comments or questions around this and maybe um, what this brings up for you, any thoughts or uh, confusion around it. And maybe what we notice in our own life. Do you seek delight in form, welcome and remain holding to it? And what is the consequence of that? Mm -hmm. Oh, Julian's there. Hi, Julian. Nice to see you. So this is kind of deep stuff. And I am hoping we can have a discussion which is practical as well and informs our life. Suzanne. Are you able to unmute? Yes. Hi. Good evening. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm still working on understanding these five uh, uh, aggregates. Is that the right word? <laughs> Heaps, components, yeah. <laughs> so what is the difference between like a volitional, how do you translate? I yeah, well, here it's translated as volitional formations. What, what, is, what is that? It's kind of the reactive part of the mind. It's the comma producing part of the mind. So, I mean, one of the way I understand, one of the ways I understand these is that they're in a sense sequential. So there's material form. Yes. And due to that, there's the contact between, in a way, materiality of the body or any of the sense organs. Feeling arises when there's contact, right? So you can easily feel that, like if you have a body and you pinch it, then there's a feeling. Mm -hmm. So there's pleasure, pain, or something in between, right? And then you're also percipient of that. So the next one is perception. You're aware this is painful. Yeah. Right? Judge this as pain, pleasure, whatever. You you perceive that. Mm -hmm. And then um, the next one is uh, the volitional formation, which really means what you make of it. So it's like the, I don't like that. I don't want that. I have to get away from that. This is terrible. It shouldn't be happening. Okay. Or, or I want, want to keep it. Or I want more of it. Yeah. yeah. I want to hold on to it. I want to increase it. You know, I need uh -huh. to do this again and again. Okay. And then the, um, and then that gives, well, and then consciousness is there too. You're aware of all of this. And okay. also the reactivity that you have, like the, the sankara, the volitional formation, if you like, the reaction that you generate influences the kind of consciousness that, that arises. Okay. So, you know, you might have, just in a very basic way, you might have um, a mind that is peaceful if you're not clinging too much, or you might have a mind that becomes very tight, very tense, so consciousness is kind of um, constricted or restricted. It's, um, yeah. Yeah. But also consciousness is uh, something that, arises and in the end is uh 
uh, causes suffering. It's not like, yeah, consciousness also is um, something not. It, do you, do you yeah. understand what I mean? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, yeah, this is very subtle, right? This is okay. very subtle. Like, actually, to know is to suffer. Okay. This is very subtle because in the beginning, we, you know, when we start on the path, we think that it's just clinging to these aggregates or, or components of existence. It's just clinging to form or clinging to feeling that is yeah. the, the problem. But uh, later on, we realize that suffering is very inherent in these very things yeah so and even be, really being conscious best. of 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 the process that is going on inside of me is still like there's still something uh grasping or clinging in that usually yes okay <laughs> usually, that's interesting yeah. i mean there are various degrees of grasping so i think at the level of practice we can't skip straight to kind of seeing the conditioned nature of consciousness or trying to sort of have a more refined consciousness but we can start to um mm, we can start to um diminish our tendency if you like through mindfulness to react in ways that brings about more suffering in a very obvious way and after a while the mind consciousness itself and the consciousness itself becomes more refined mm -hmm. because of that and so it becomes increasingly less of a cause of suffering okay mm -hmm. And um, I had a, um, in a meditation uh, that I had, I had on a kind of a vision, I would say, and I, I, I would be interested how you, how this fits in. And it was um, uh, kind of a, I was a dark space, I would say. I was a dark space and there was little light dots everywhere. And I was aware of that these dots are just kind of the base for from, from matter for this universe. And they were just there. and and that when um that i am the one who connects these dots and makes something of it uh -huh. and, and and really they are not really con even connected it's just me doing it you know and uh -huh. yeah 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 so does that kind of relate to this in a way um mm, i mean you are moving from material objects of your meditation into mental objects at this point so for example when we start to meditate often what we're aware of is like the body which is rupa yeah and we're aware of feelings in the body and if we're aware of our thought processes we realize that the thoughts are also about the sensual world mostly they're about sight sounds smells tastes and touches even the breath is a subtle form of like rupa is feeling but it's also physical right it, there's a physicality to the breath But after a while, when the mind starts to calm, then the breath actually changes and becomes a mental object. And when the mind gets stiller, then this breath can manifest as light. So in the beginning, it starts like you explained, it can start just with a little bit of light or with a flash or sometimes with a whole kind of screen of light, sometimes little lights that come and go. And it feels more refined because you're actually starting to perceive the breath through the mind. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the mind consciousness is becoming mm, more apparent, let's say. More mm. apparent. It's becoming separated out from the five senses. Um, so you're starting to experience more mental states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, subtler mental states. Mm -hmm. And that's often described as feelings of love or feelings of peace or bliss or something like this. Um, yeah, and what you noticed about the self that wants to connect them or whatever, it's there's still a sense of self there that wants to do something about it, right? That wants to get involved. And this is usually a kind of sankara. This is an, again, a volitional reaction. It's a reaction. Um, and that tends to prevent it going deeper. Yeah, I know moment. you're talking. Yeah, I, I don't, mm, I don't feel quite understood right now. I don't know if we keep talking uh -huh. or just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a meditation question, so I guess it's a little yeah. bit technical and beyond the scope. But I don't mind to come back to it, but I just want to yeah, see. Yeah, we could maybe do that later. Yeah, okay, let's do that later. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Shirley. Thank you. Uh, 
been thinking about delight and uh, yes I take delight in sense pleasures and I take delight in spiritual pleasures like reading the Dhamma and seeing you guys and thinking about that lovely clay statue made by wonderful venerable Dhammananda and it's all sort of based when you think about it yes it's all based on on your sort of sense contact um, and I suppose I'm sort of feeling it's okay to be delighted because it's joy and there are a lot of there are a lot of I mean joy is part of the path I mean there are lots of Pali words for joy but it's this and then I, I was thinking yeah it's all right as long as you don't cling to it <laughs> and then I thought but he's not talking about he's not actually am I right he's not actually saying it's it's going to lead to suffering to take delight it's to seek delight so that's looking for uh, a pleasure that isn't there if there's something coming to you if one yes. suppose if one enjoys it and if like william blake you kiss the joy as it flies mm -hmm. yeah and because i i actually feel that these feelings of appreciation gratitude um are are actually quite can be actually quite wholesome feelings yes um and uh, you know we're not supposed to just sort of look all oh dear it's all impermanent and we're all going to die and, oh, you know because um i think it can be very nourishing and wholesome um but i suppose what i'm saying is that one has to be very mindful that one doesn't when one's had a delightful experience like for example if i couldn't connect to zoom you know i mean this is a wholesome thing to do it's a wholesome delight but if i couldn't connect to zoom or my zoom suddenly fell out i and i got really attached to it then i would suffer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i think so i mean that, that's what i'm saying yeah, I know I know I mean, completely. yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Nice. It's but it's question. very subtle because it's just so easy to get stuck yeah, isn't it? absolutely and this is kind of what I anticipated really as a, a, the discussion point the main discussion point today and I think you're right that um, you know the first part of the paragraph is that one seeks delight one welcomes and one remains holding so this is definitely um, an active kind of seeking of mm. delight and in a sense very obviously close to clinging right um, because there's no contentment no, there, is there, uh, okay. Venerable? If you're looking for some, I think contentment's another thing. And if you're not, if you're dis, if you're seeking delight, you're discontented. Right. So that's one part of it, right? But then it also says delight in form, or delight in feeling, or delight in consciousness is clinging. Yeah. yeah. So I think here. The Buddha is going one step further, but at the same time, I would say there are very different degrees of unskillfulness around delight. And I really wonder what the sense, the Pali word is actually. I imagine it's something like Nandi Vaga. I don't think the word delight includes gratitude or inspiration or dumb or even piti sukha. It's a different word. This is a certain delight in. Mm in the five khandhas that one welcomes and remains holding to. So it's obviously much closer to clinging than, I mean, something like joy, rapture, piti, pasadi, they're actually born of letting go. Yeah. So that's a completely different thing. And I think, you know, delight isn't always unethical. There are different degrees, right? I mean, do you delight in, say, reading the Dhamma? Or do you delight in, I don't know, watching boxing or watching something <laughs> kind of unwholesome right that's going to stimulate greed hate and delusion in a very coarse way so i think it very much depends also the coarseness of the object and the con and the contact will determine to some extent the degree of suffering that arises from it does that make sense yeah um it was interesting somebody once gave a a, a reflection we were at a at a retreat day and you know sort of just before the pre prepared lunch where everybody's brought delightful things and the the guy who was leading it said 
you know, it's not just enjoying the taste of the food, but appreciating the generosity and kindness of the people yeah. who brought it. Yeah. And I don't think there's any clinging there in actually appreciating generosity and kindness. There may be, I suppose. If it- I mean, I think there is. <laughs> I, mean, I think oh. we've, we've this stage in the path we have clinging to pretty much everything. <laughs> as long as we're not kind of anagamis, there'll be a subtle degree. But yeah, I think yeah. it comes that... Um, by redirecting our mind from the sensuality, the sensual delight to the mental delight, it's kind of starting to wean off and into something much more beautiful and much more less likely to produce clinging. Mm-hmm. That is something that's going to um, help us overcome clinging to those coarser things. So yeah, I think that's a very skillful way to uh, work because we're not meant to push things away. I mean, again, he's not saying don't don't have delight, don't welcome, don't remain holding. He's just saying we need to understand how these things arise and they arise due to delighting in them. If we didn't delight in them, they wouldn't arise because they simply wouldn't come into our mind in the first place. You know? mm. So he's talking about, you know, the point of them getting to the point where they don't even arise. As long as we're interested, as long as we delight, as long as we hold and seek and all the rest, and even just enjoy, we will keep experiencing these things. Mm. Which is okay, but I think we need to have, it, it's almost like mm, one part of it is understanding that, but another part is learning that there's, although he's not spelling it out, there's something more refined, there's something more beautiful, and that is you know, developing the qualities of the Dhamma, the qualities of the path. Yeah. Yeah, I, what I'm thinking is that before we can let go at that level, yeah, good to work in maybe work on the appreciation and the delight in wholesome objects to, as you say, wean us off the more unwholesome ones. So it's it could be it could be a, it could be a skillful means to some extent without. Yeah. You know, to actually develop develop qualities such as joy, appreciation, gratitude. Mm. Yes, I think so. I I find those very helpful and my practice would be very dry if I didn't do that. Definitely, yeah. Um, I think also we have to, you know, it's an invitation to notice how when we seek delight, when we remain holding, we create suffering. It's an invitation. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, And if somebody, a beautiful person who we... Uh, who we admire and take rejoice in their goodness suddenly does something awful, then, you know, that happens, that sort of thing happens because we're in samsara. So, yeah, anyway, I've said it, but it's very, it's very, uh, it's very rich. So it's really helpful to reflect yeah. on and these things. Yeah, and I think we have to be really honest with ourselves, you know, it's not to sort of say, oh, no, but I do this, oh, dear, uh, you know, that's not good. Maybe you didn't mean that. It's, it's actually an invitation for us to see how these things might lead to suffering. We don't have to accept that they do, but if we're invited to see that they might, <laughs> we might actually find a way to... Um, lessen that suffering by changing our relationship to these things. Tainga. Hi, um, I have two questions. Um, the first one, um, from clinging to existence, it feels like that's a big drum. So I'm wondering how, how, how um, clinging lead to existence? Right. <laughs> you want to go for it? <laughs> How does clinging lead to existence? Well, that is the ah, that is the origin <laughs> where you could go back to the Paticca Sampada, which is the which is you know the reason we are here in where the reason we are born is because of this in of this desire to cling and to to, to be and um, this is what the buddha says leads us from life to life you know we want to exist we want to 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 become every every lifetime because of our desire because of our clinging 
that's the reason we are born that is the that is the sort of great revelation of the buddha but it's also on a mundane everyday day to day level you know um when you feel um say upset with someone you go like hey i exist you know i'm someone who's upset i'm just not nobody i'm someone <laughs> so we also exist because we like to cling or you notice very subtly you like uh you like uh, ice cream i like ice cream it's not just i ice cream <laughs> <laughs> i'm someone who likes ice cream and i like this ice cream i don't like this ice cream and i'm somebody who likes ice cream <laughs> so <laughs> in a, also very um, gross way we start to exist we start to be someone who likes things uh, or dislikes things but if we just kind of like you know went past the ice cream parlor that whole whole me and mine and what i need all of that doesn't start to bother us so it does that help so clinging also comes with a sense of self yeah it comes from a sense of self yeah from a sense of self yeah it arises mm -hmm. from the sense of self and it also creates the sense of self yeah it's, it's yeah reinforces it i was just thinking that some pop songs are actually true aren't they mm. oh baby you're the reason i exist you know it's actually probably true <laughs> 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 isn't it mm. you know we exist yeah. in a certain way yeah, yeah. like yeah in relation to that clinging yeah and it's not only that we exist yeah like there are three kinds of major clinging like the craving to be the craving for sensuality and the craving not to be as well. Mm. You know, sometimes because of the sense of self, we actually suffer and then we think, I don't want to live like this. I don't want to be, I don't want to exist. Mm. So, but these all perpetuate our mm. kind of, if you like, being knotted up with this world, like when we're tied into it. Mm. Mm. But yeah, this is a huge question, actually, because I mean, that is the, the kind of proximate cause to being born. We were only we're born because we want to be. There's still things we want to see, smell, hear, taste, touch and think about and know even subtle things. You know, we're addicted to maybe mental pleasures, too. We're addicted to even meditative states. And these all create more existence for us in which we are going to experience sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, depending on the level of existence, but even in the higher realms, there's still suffering because people or be beings, devas, have to fall from those realms. Mm -hmm. So after a while, we just realize that wherever we go, we're going to experience suffering. And it's more peaceful when things cease, which we haven't even got to yet. We've not got to the cessation part. Yeah, but, yeah. Okay. And I also ask another question. Um, um at in the, at the beginning it says um it started when we start to seek delight in the five counters yeah how did we start to seek delight in them in the first place like why why do we do that well the buddha didn't quite go into where it began as such but it's really because of delusion so actually yeah there's a deeper cause in this particular samapada which is delusion it's through not knowing through not understanding where our happiness and suffering really lies that we try to seek that happiness in places that doesn't really work <laughs> that's a simple answer it's a delusion yeah <laughs> Because of delusion, we crave, right? Because of the delusion of a sense of self or the delusion mm -hmm. of um, the fact that we can get some kind of permanent happiness or the delusion that there is, um, there is a self in the first place. Um, because of this, we keep on craving. So we, we, feel, we feel the delight only because we thought that is delightful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 In that. a sense, I mean, it is delightful to us at first until we understand that it isn't. <laughs> this is why we can't kind of push it aside. You know, we've got to be real. Okay, I'm still enjoying this and this and this. Mm. 
And then after a while, you just don't enjoy it anymore as the wisdom increases and you experience like a different kind of happiness that comes from within. The things that we thought were delightful don't really entice us anymore in the same way. Or we have a different relationship with them. We don't grasp them so much. We don't depend on them so much. So we can let them in and let them out. Like um, Shirley said, you know, we can um, kiss the joy as it flies. (laughs) <laughs> and we don't seek it it comes when it comes it goes when it goes mm-hmm. there's a few more questions so i want to um, okay yeah thank you uh, thank you very much to the chat and to uh Mukund as well and did cynthia yeah. have her hand up as well yeah i was just wanted to ask if this is really like is he is the Buddha talking about equanimity right is it like because then you're not seeking and you're not, you're not, uh, what is the word, delight. There's not delight, there's just. Right, well, this is something, so did everyone hear that question? Mm. Yeah, well, not everyone. So um, Cynthia was asking, uh, does this mean the Buddha's talking about equanimity? And that's a great question because he's not expressly talking about it. But this is, I think, how it helps us to start asking the questions. I think that's what he's trying to do. Um, is to help give rise to those questions. So what is the alternative in a sense, right? Yeah. And we were talking about this at tea time about equanimity and saying that one of the people who was with us was saying that that actually put them off the Dhamma for a long time because they understood it to mean some kind of flat state. And it took them a really long time to understand that equanimity is perhaps a bad translation, but also um, it's actually closer to something like love and contentment. It actually includes those things. And I would say, for me anyway, the opposite of something like seeking delight and all the rest is a quality close to contentment, close to peace, close to equanimity. I think they're facets of the same. Um, But I think this is really what we have to explore, isn't it? Because language is kind of limited when we're trying to point to something different. But we know it for ourselves, don't we? When we have a feeling and we're holding on to it. Even a negative feeling, we're holding on to it in the sense we want to get rid. Yeah. And then when we just loosen that grasp and we become content with it, whether it's unpleasant or pleasant, we're content. We don't want it to increase. We don't want it to go away. We're just okay. It's like I'm going to be content whatever. Yeah. And then that affects the mind in a very different way and it undermines the craving. So I, I actually think contentment is an antidote to, to clinging and delight. Yeah. yeah, but certainly equanimity as well. Right. Before you said it, I was already thinking about yeah. when you think about ice cream. Yeah. You know, desiring mm-hmm. ice cream because you don't have any right now. And then you think mm-hmm. the ice cream is the thing that's going right. to make me happy right now. Like it can fix everything if I just had some ice cream. And then after you eat the ice cream, all the things that didn't fix are still there. Right. You know, you're suffering. Right, and often we think it's the ice cream, mm. right? Yeah, but it's actually it's just cream. a feeling. That's right. We as think we it spoke was about, about the ice before, cream. yeah. Right. But it's a feeling that that's we don't right. like that we want to increase that's right. or improve. Mm. Yeah. All right, I'm going to come to Mukund. There's quite a lot of chat questions too, and I don't know how this time has flown. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, one reaction, one question. I mean, uh, this just reminded me of uh, this, all this discussion on clinging. Uh, uh, the Buddha was once asked to summarize the teachings in one line, and he said, you know, um, some dhamma nalanga vinivesaya, like all dhammas should not be, you know, clung on to. So, I mean, don't, don't cling to anything, uh, which is just, uh, I think, just remarkable. I mean, this just uh, amazing. Uh, my question is, I, I never made this connection between delight and clinging. And could you just expand a bit on that? Because mm. uh, often it feels like delight is said in a very positive way, right? In terms of, you know, the, all these people heard the talk, of the, uh, they all delighted in the in the teachings of the Buddha. And like, you know, so, uh, right. Uh, yeah. So, I have to see the Pali, but I think, yes, it's different. Uh, by the way, thank you for that quote. It's one of my favorite um, Pali lines in the suttas. <laughs> nothing is worth clinging to. What does Ajahn Brahm sometimes say? Nothing is, yeah, nothing. Yeah, sometimes people say nothing should be clung to, but he says something like nothing is worth keeping. Nothing is worth keeping. This is really like, wow, <laughs> don't even hold it, you know, don't even keep it. But yeah, it's interesting. I think I'm guessing that the word delight here is like Nandi Raga. 
which is straight out of the second noble truth, Nandi Raga Sahagata Tatra Tatra Binandini, like seeking delight now, here, now, there. And then, yeah, if we do that, then we automatically cling. It's like it arises simultaneously. So that's why it says further down, delight is clinging. Delight in form, delight in feeling, delight in any of it is clinging in and of itself. So I don't think it's the same delight as the delight that arose at the end of a sutta. I think that's different. I'm not sure, again, what the translation mm -hmm. there is at the end of the suttas. But um, that's clearly a kind of inspirational delight. And, and the Terigata and the Terigata are full of that kind of joyful delight in the Dhamma. And this is clearly mm -hmm. something that he, you know, um, very much talked about Dhamma Veda, Atta Veda, inspiration in the Dhamma, inspiration in the meaning, in other words, the consequence of practicing the Dhamma, the meaning of peace, the meaning of stillness, the meaning of liberation, enlightenment, Nibbana. So this is something very different. And um, I guess the delight we're talking about here is directly caught up with these aggregates. And perhaps there's a key to it in the sense that it's because we're identifying with these aggregates as aspects of a self, aspects of a self. And that's why there's so much holding, right? Because this perception is me, it is who I am. This is the way I perceive things. This is real. This is how I am, right? Or I feel this way. This is, I feel myself. When I'm not well, I'm not myself. When I feel better, I'm, I feel myself again, you know? Or the way we think, the way we use our minds, we really identify with that, right? We think it's me seeing, we think it's me um, feeling. I think it might be, the clue might be there because these five components of existence are related to existence, they're related to a, a sense of self, something very solid. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the Buddha here is talking about understanding their arising and passing. Because when we understand that they arise due to causes, they pass away due to causes, then it's very hard to take them as belonging to a self or being comprising a self or, you know, having a self somewhere hidden inside them. <laughs> yeah. So perhaps it's that kind of clinging that actually reinforces that self-view. And I think delighting the Dhamma is the opposite, isn't it? Because the Dhamma is something that tries to um, loosen our grip on that self-view. Yeah. So maybe the translation here, the word delight in English is quite a positive thing, usually. What do you think? Anything? You just have to know the Pali terms. Mm. Well, that's definitely... Nanda or something, isn't it? Tatra Chantra Binandini. Mm. I'm pretty sure that's how delight is usually translated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Does that help at all? Does that make sense? We hadn't actually come to the part of it disappearing. I'll try and get to um, uh, the questions in the box and then maybe read the last part about the disappearance because. Uh, it's basically the opposite, <laughs> but I think it completes it really nicely if we get to that. So, uh, okay, here's another question. Is craving or clinging always in the past or future and not related to the present moment? I'd say no. It arises in the present moment to whatever's arising. Uh, even if it's from the past or the future, it's the way you feel about the past and future now, usually. Uh, because if so, it makes sense why the self feels uncomfortable with staying in the present moment. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, I think it's uncomfortable to be in the present moment simply because craving does arise in the present moment. <laughs> and also uh, the present moment is, if we're really honest to the present moment, it's a moment of the arising of suffering. <laughs> And in that moment, there's actually not much space for the sense of self, if we're really honest to it. And it's kind of like, ee, we wriggle, we wriggle away from it, don't we? We just don't want to be, wriggle and squirm like a wiggly worm. <laughs> yeah, it is. The sense of self is definitely uncomfortable in the present. I suppose the past and the future and our thoughts around it create a sense of identity for us. You know, I did this, I went here, I went there. That time I was friends with them. They said this about me, you know, which was pleasant or unpleasant. 
and in the future this is what I need to do because I worked for it or you know this might happen to me and this would be a disaster having done all what I've done in the past it would be terrible if I end up like that you know it, yeah so well actually it's funny I guess wherever our mind is we're going to find some discomfort the irony is that when we're able to stay present to it it lessens <laughs> But it's finding ways to to get comfortable with what's arising. And I think, again, just really softening our mind to it, not just saying, right, I've got to go in there and be aware, or be equanimous, but actually, how can I really hold this with kindness? You know, how can I just find a way to be content with this and to really allow it in, to really allow it? Because it isn't me, it isn't mine. For me, the reflection on oneself helps a lot to soften that kind of uh, the will that needs to do something about it. Mm. You want to do this? Mm -hmm. um, I have also experienced suffering coming out of deep, fulfilling meditation, mm -hmm. having to come back into the world of senses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is a, a great insight when you find that the world of senses is jarring what you previously thought was a great old place. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when yeah. you come back out of meditation, you go like, wow, what have I been wasting my time with so that's that's the that's that's the path of meditation yeah and that's where the insight into suffering can arise which is why these deep meditations are so helpful because mm. you start to realize that in comparison to that yeah the world of the senses is mm. suffering mm. hopefully you have a bit more mm. peace to it mm -hmm. but that i think takes time as well because at first we crave to go back into those states mm. <laughs> yes, yes 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 and then the problem starts all over again <laughs> yeah. yes. mm. well, it's a process yeah yeah. The Buddha said contentment is the greatest wealth, correct? Mm -hmm. As far as I can work out, the Pali is Abhinandati. Oh, yeah, okay, again, it's yeah. that word Nanda. Right. In fact, she's called Nanda. I called her Nanda because there is a kind of Nanda, right? That's nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Delight. Delight yeah. in the Dhamma. Tatra Tatra Abhinandani. Mm -hmm. It's like in the Dhamma Chakra Sutta, it's, yes, it's. Nanda or Abhinandati, but it's seeking delight ever here, ever there. So it's again the seeking of it and the kind of constant, it comes from a sense of deficit, I think, rather than a sense of contentment. If you have contentment, I mean, you don't need, you don't need anything, right? Contentment mm -hmm. means contentment with happiness and contentment with suffering equally. Content means literally you are so at peace with whatever arises, you just don't even want to change it. It's very powerful because it's sort of moving out of defining our happiness in terms of the feelings and the experience at the senses and changing it into quality of mind. The quality of your mind is what brings the happiness. I must say having a chronic sickness helps me to see that because I can't find happiness in the body very much at all. Even in food, I mean, I'm usually only enjoying it if I feel like it might not make me sick. And certainly if I'm already sick, it doesn't matter what I eat, it's kind of, it's not enticing. <laughs> but I eat because I have to eat. And um, yeah, quite often, usually there's some burning, some headaches, some kind of really sharp wind somewhere. Um, and yeah, I just have to find happiness through the meaning of my life and the joy that I feel, especially around the Dhamma, teaching the Dhamma, the joy around the qualities that we've been mentioning, gratitude, equanimity, acceptance is a big one. Um, not always possible, but certainly most of my happiness is from there, you know, the vast majority, I'd say. Yeah. Um, well, we do have a few minutes and I think uh, it'd be nice to just read the last part because this is usually the opposite. I don't know if that's what it meant by dire something conditionality. But uh, in the footnotes, we read diachronic conditionality. If anyone knows what that means, please let me know. So um, we've talked about the origin 
of the five aggregates or the five components of existence. And now the Buddha wants to talk about the passing away of these things. And again, this is something to be understood, to be explored, to be examined, investigated through our own practice. Um, so here it goes. And what community is the passing away of form? What is the passing away of feeling, of perception, of volitional formations or mental volition or reactivity, if you like? And what is the passing away of consciousness? Here, one does not seek delight. One does not welcome. One does, does not remain holding. And what is it that one does not seek delight in? What doesn't one welcome? To what doesn't one remain holding? One does not seek delight in form, does not welcome it, does not remain holding to it. As a consequence of this, delight in form ceases. With the cessation of delight comes cessation of clinging. With cessation of clinging, cessation of existence. Such and then the rest. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair, all of those things cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. One does not seek delight in feeling or perception, volitional formations or consciousness. One does not welcome them or, and does not remain holding to them. As a consequence of this, delight in all of those things, including consciousness, ceases. With the cessation of delight comes the cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of existence. So this is really the key here, that, that juncture between clinging and existence. With the cessation of existence, I'll just double check it. The cessation of birth, the cessation of aging and death, Sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair come to be. Doesn't that sound good? I mean, if life was all about, you know, didn't have displeasure, despair, etc., etc., maybe you could say it was okay, but it has all those things. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. This, because monastics or community, is the passing away of form. This is the passing away of feeling. This is the passing away of perception, the passing away of volitional formations. And this is the passing away of consciousness. In other words, no more birth. <laughs> and we can see this happening a little bit, can't we, in our practice. We can see things start to fade become less coarse, become more refined. But they only fade completely with the cessation of birth. In, in other words, when there's no more clinging, there's no more reason to be reborn. And we can, this is really what happens to the arahat, the fully liberated person who's understood suffering in its entirety and who's understood the origin of the five components of existence and seen their passing away, directly experienced it. So that's a very deep teaching from the Buddha and uh, hopefully something you can find a way to investigate and examine in your life. This is really going from like the very most kind of preliminary understanding of seeing how when we hold on or want things to be a certain way, we just create a lot of unnecessary suffering. Suffering's there, but we can add a lot to it. <laughs> Um, all the way to ending suffering completely and it's a path and most of the time perhaps the whole of our life and many lives we'll be working in just understanding how these things arise and how we can um, learn to gradually loosen our grip and at least stop seeking you know or at least stop the intensity of that seeking and uh, welcoming and holding on to and start to um, loosen our grip a little bit and enjoy the pleasure that's born of letting go of clinging. Because one of the other insights that, you know, I had a long time ago was that craving in itself is suffering. It's not just that we crave because we suffer or that craving causes us to suffer. 
that feeling of wanting, I'm sure everyone here has, um, you know, experienced this if you um, reflect, that wanting is in itself suffering because it's a lack of contentment. But we're so addicted. The Buddha said, blinded by delusion, addicted to wanting or mm. fettered by craving. Yeah. Ajahn Brahm likes to say, addicted to wanting. Yeah. But I do feel compassion, especially for Makun, because you must be wanting to sleep. <laughs> I hope you have time, or maybe you had an early start to your day, a very, very early start. So um, I hope that this has uh, brought gladness to your heart. And I don't know if there's anyone, because Manoi is not here today, to say a few words. So I might bring Cynthia in, ad lib, to say a few words at the end. What am I saying words about? Dana. Yes. Yeah. Would you like to um, come to Matthias's computer? Just a few words. Very brief. Yeah, come over here then. Yeah. Sorry. This is what happens to monastics too. It's part of our training. People get landed in the deep end. <laughs> but Cynthia's very good at this, so just be yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just come here. Behind us. Here next week. Yes. Come, come, come. <laughs> just say a few words about. Yes. 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 Hi, friends. <laughs> this is lovely, Cynthia. Who's very brave. I can't really sit on the floor. Hi. Um, no. Oh. So Hi. <laughs> Maybe Matthias can put some links. Yes, Matthias will put some links. Okay. Um, Just two minutes. There's, uh, let's see. Um, Matthias is going to put some links to um, help you find out how to support the Anacampa um, Monastery and um, the, the, the events that are happening this weekend too. Are you, or next week with Ajahn Brahmali coming? We have four or five talks around town that are coming. Um, there's also a, if you're local, there's a Donna calendar and, um, what else, uh, what else can yeah. I say? Um, Generosity. yeah, just, I think everybody should sign up and try to come here and just feel how amazing it is to, um, be in this space and just be able to support an actual Bakuni monastery in, in the UK. It's so, you get here and you feel so held and so supported by the Dhamma. And um, I can say that's how I felt when I got here like five days ago. And um, I hope you all can come. And if not, if you can't come, then you can support us from wherever you are by following, uh, I think, whatever Matthias is linking in the chat. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. You're yeah. welcome. All right. I don't know if you've got any links. Otherwise, I'll write some in. Uh, okay. So you can find our events here. I'm sure you all know this by now. And uh, you can look around the website for whatever else you want. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we will not see you next week because we do have Ajahn Pramali in the UK. So he's teaching Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And then on Tuesday next week, that's the 18th, um, Ajahn Brahm and myself are teaching an online retreat for three days. We do have places for people who want to join even from uh, different time zones. It's okay. You can catch up with the ones that you miss another time. Um, if you want to just join anyway, that's fine. You can have your own schedule, etc., etc. So that's happening next week as well for those lucky enough to be able to take time off. And we'll upload the recordings as well. So uh, what else? I have a retreat in Devon from the 3rd or 4th to the 7th of July. And I'll be on my mains retreat from the 19th. But for the Sutta class, we'll be back with you in two weeks. And in the meantime, if you would like to, you could read the first chapter of the Kanda Samyutta, the introduction to the Samyutta that we just talked about. Or... We might do a sutta from the Nadana Samyutta next week, so you could also read the introduction to that, whatever you wish. I just want to get you in there 
reading this stuff because it's really um, transformative. All right. So take care, everybody. We'll unmute you now. We'll stop the recording and I will wave goodbye.